Okay, thanks everyone for coming tonight. We are lucky to have Dr. Kavitha Ramchandran with us tonight. She is Clinical Associate Professor of Medicine and on Oncology here at Stanford Medical Center. Um, Dr. Ramchandran did her undergraduate studies here at Stanford. She had her medical residency training at University of California in San Francisco. And then she did a fellowship in cancer care and palliative medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago. Then she came back, knowing the best place in the world, uh, she came back to Stanford to be on the faculty in the year 2007. So Dr. Ramchandran is recognized for her contributions as a leader in the integration of palliative and oncology or cancer care. She is also the medical director of palliative medicine at Stanford Cancer Institute here. In her care of patients, Dr. Ramchandran values a deep relationship with the families she cares for. She provides care that is aligned with the patient and family's personal values with the goal of the best quality of life possible. So she will present her talk. I'm letting you know in advance that we ask people to, to you will probably have questions and that's good. We, wait, we ask people to wait until she's finished her talk to have questions then so that the video recording can continue uninterrupted um, in the beginning. And then we'll, have pl we'll leave plenty of time for questions afterwards. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I felt very honored to be asked to do this and to spend time with our community here in the Bay Area and to speak with you all and um, learn a little bit about what's most important to you um, as members of our um, beloved community. So I wanted to start by asking um, how many of you would have considered yourself to have been a patient at some point in your life? If you could raise your hand. Be a patient. Okay. Yeah. And how many of you would have considered yourself to be a caregiver or a loved one for a family member? Okay. So I would hope that this topic... Oh, yes. I apologize. Okay. Um, I can't tell what the microphone is doing and what my voice is doing. Is this better? Okay, perfect. So we actually are going to cover a lot of ground. This topic is actually quite broad and deep at the same time. So I really wanted to cover a wide scope, knowing that we'll have a little bit of time for question, answer, and talking through areas that are of interest to all of you, but also recognizing that we might hit some topics that are hard to hear about and hard to listen to. And if that's the case, I really will not be offended if you need to step up, take a deep breath, walk out of the room, come back in. I recognize this is personal for many of us um, and that we're doing this out of wanting to care for ourselves and care for the ones that we love um, with the biggest heart um, and knowledge. So um, just wanted to put that out there. So um, the topic and, uh, is called Dying to Know, What Patients and Families Want to Know About End-of-Life Care. So I wanted to start off with something that um, seems relatively straightforward, but is actually an area of uh, confusion in healthcare, which is this idea of disclosure, the action of making new or secret information known. And the reason I bring this up to you is because one of the most common questions that I get as an oncologist or as a palliative care doc is, how much time do I have, doc? Tell it to me straight. And I can't tell you how often I talk to patients and frustrated family members who are like, I've asked and I've asked again and I've asked again and I can't get a straight answer from anyone as to how this illness will affect my lifespan, how it will affect my quality of life. And the one thing that we know is that for you to have less anxiety and to be able to plan forward, you need to have some idea of what timelines look like, what quality of life looks like. So there has been studies looking at whether patients want to know about prognosis, and the majority of people say yes. We do want to know about whether or not this illness could affect us and in what time frame. 
We also know that if people know how much time they have, they make better decisions about what they would want to do with that time. Decisions about how they would spend that time with family, and decisions about how they would make choices about care that they would want to receive from their medical providers, whether that be care in the hospital, or care in the ICU, or care at home. But if you don't know, it's unlikely that you'll be able to make an informed decision about the next steps. We know that people want to know a whole bunch of things. They want to know what their diagnosis is. They want to know what the range of time that there is, what the chances of those treatments working for them, how would it work, for how long will it work. People want facts and they want details. But we also know something quite um, troublesome, which is a, a lot of doctors are very uh, reluctant to talk about prognosis. And so this concept of disclosure is fraught with a lot of questions and concerns because when physicians are not talking about prognosis, patients and family members can't plan forward. And so why is that? We, I think it's for two reasons. One is that it makes us really uncomfortable to talk about prognosis. So we're very, uh, physicians have a hard time admitting what makes them uncomfortable, but I think it makes us uncomfortable to talk about end of life and to talk about a point when our treatments are no longer going to be helpful. And the second thing is I think sometimes we just don't know. So it's very easy for us to give people a timeline if we know, but more often than not, we feel sometimes as befuddled as you do. We don't know. And that's changing week by week. And if you look at cancer medicine, a few years ago, we could tell you, yes, this illness has this type of prognosis. But now, with the range of therapies that have come into play, we're even more confused. We really have a very difficult time providing people an accurate estimation of time. So I'm going to switch gears a little bit. So that's a little bit about the physician-patient relationship and talking a little bit about disclosure. And I think this is really important. Um, and I hope that when we talk at the end as a group, be interested to hear your thoughts on how you've talked about disclosure for yourself or for your loved ones, how you've encountered information from your providers, what you found to be most helpful. Um, but then I'm going to switch it a little bit to a more personal area, which is, when people do know that they're facing a terminal illness, what is coming to mind? And these are things that I have heard in my care for patients and families and have experienced in caring for my friends. Um, and some common themes, but this is not everything. So I want to be cognizant of the fact that others might have other pieces here. So what are people thinking about? Um, people are thinking about what does the dying process look like? They're worried about loss of control. They're worried about how this will affect people that they love. How will others react? Will they be isolated? And what will give them meaning? A lot of people worry most about losing their ability to have a say in the process. A lot of times patients come to me and say, do I have a say in this at all? I have some ideas of what I want for myself. I know I want to die at home. I know I want everything done. I know there are some people who don't want everything done, but I want everything done. And doc, what does that mean? I want to be uncomfortable. I don't care what the disease looks like. I just don't want to have pain. Or I want to be in control. I want to make sure that I have a say in what's going to happen to me next, even if I get weak, even if I'm not able to communicate. So that brings me to this concept of goals of care. And I'm just curious, has anyone heard of this concept in their um, discussions with their providers. Okay, and at the end I'll ask a little bit about what this means to all of you. So it's a small minority of, of you that have heard of the concept of goals of care. So this is in the heart of hearts, um, the concept of informed consent. So if you ever go in for a procedure, like a surgery, or if you go in um, even to sign a contract for a home, you want to know all of the risks and all of the benefits of doing this. And you hope that when you're doing this with your medical provider, you're going through a process of informed consent. And so when we're making decisions about how we are supposed to provide medical care, 
with all of you, we hope that we're doing this in a dyad where you're providing us the information that you need to tell us about who you are, about what you value, about what's important to you, and we're providing you the information you need about what this treatment can do and whether or not we recommend it. Often, when we have this dyad, the, the conversations are in two separate languages. So a common example is that the doctor says, Thank you so much, Mr. S. You have diagnosis Y. We would recommend treatment Z, and we would do it immediately. And you might come out and say, well, the doctor recommended Z, but I don't really know why he recommended Z, or if Z is actually going to help me to feel better, or to live longer, or how, how much it's going to cost me, or whether there are other consequences that I should have asked about but didn't know about. So I recommend a dialogue with your physicians, especially when it comes to questions around treatments, when you know that you're really bent, like, um, having to balance treatment versus quality of life, is to have a mode where you, we call it ask, tell, ask. So a physician will ask you a question such as, can you tell me a little bit about what you understand about your illness? And you have an opportunity to tell the doctor, yeah, you know, I got the CT scan. It was done two weeks ago. I was told that I have a new diagnosis of cancer. I don't know what stage it is, but I hear it's bad. Then the doctor says, OK, you have a lot of good information. Let me fill you in on the details. It's stage two, which means it's localized. We'd hope that we could treat you with surgery, and the goal is cure. And then he might say something like, you know, sometimes when I explain these things, it's difficult for people to understand. Can you tell me what I told you again? And so that you have an opportunity to say, oh, doctor, it's not as bad as I thought. It's an early stage cancer, and it's curable. So I'm really happy. But if you don't do that process in the room, if you don't have that dialogue in the room, you have what was that first conversation, which is you walk into the room, the doctor tells you you have a diagnosis and we should do this procedure within two weeks. And you leave and you're like, I don't know why I'm doing that procedure or what the purpose is and whether it's going to help me. And the reason I bring this to you, this is a very common medical teaching tool in palliative medicine and communication, is you can advocate for yourself. If you're in a clinic setting, can you say, hey, doctor, can we do it this way? And can I tell you what I know about my illness before you telling me everything you know about the illness? And then can you tell me back if I'm right or wrong? And then can I just make sure that I understood everything I heard? And the reason I say this is for you to make any decisions that are in line with your goals of care, you need to have that core information down. And then I put this other piece of it, which is that we need to know who you are before we can make a decision about what the right treatment is. So what does that mean? So a lot of times you go into a procedure and the doctor will say, you have 25% chance of having a very bad outcome, which could be a stroke. It could be the fact that you could have a hemorrhage. You could have a heart attack. But there's a 25% chance of that happening. And you're like, oh, man, that kind of sucks. But I guess I'm going to go into it anyway. Or you might be told you have a 0.1% chance of cognitive deficits and you may not be able to speak or talk. Also doesn't sound so great. But you still don't completely know what that means. So one of my physician friends had to make a decision on behalf of her father. And he, she asked her father, she said, you are going to go through this big neurosurgical procedure. You know, Paraplegia is one of the risks, which means you might not be able to walk. But he was told paraplegia. He's like, what does that mean? He's like, you might not be able to walk. And I don't know what I should do for you. She was a physician. He was not a physician. How do I take care of you as my father? How do I ensure that going through this procedure is what you want? And he said, well, I really want to be able to watch football and eat chocolate ice cream. And she was like, really? That's what you want? He's like, yes. If you can ask the neurosurgeon if I can watch football and eat chocolate ice cream at the end of this procedure, go for it. She was like, oh, I can do that. And suddenly, it all just became clear. It was about what, that, what her dad valued, what was most important for him over the course of the time that he had left. 
he didn't need to play football. And he didn't necessarily even have to be all that ambulatory, but he just needed to be able to relate to his family members, have good conversations, eat well, and that was good enough. That was what was important to him. And then the doctors were completely clear too. They were like, okay, we got it. We, want, we can do this procedure because we know that the risks are okay. He's okay with the risks. And so if you can start to reframe the conversations that you're having with family to not just be about, I don't want to be coded and on a machine, or I don't want to be on a ventilator, but instead, you know, I really want to live my life this way. These are the things that are most important to me. These are the things that have meaning for me. And that might change. That's why this is a living conversation. You know, when you're 25, you may want to play football and swim in the bay and I don't know, I don't actually know what 25 year olds do anymore, um, but <laughs> do all those crazy things. But when you're 65, you might be happy, you know, being able to have a good dinner with your friends and be able to play chess and be able to go on a hike. But that changes decade to decade, moment to moment, year to year, it even changes in the same person who has the same body. Someone who's had a spinal injury who might have thought they didn't want something suddenly is okay with something. So you have to have these living conversations about what's meaningful, what gives people quality of life. And those need to happen with family members early and often. And then they need to be translated to the medical provider in a way that they can say, aha, I get it. I know how I can help you. And that's what we call understanding quality of life and understanding trade-offs in a way that's not medical jargon anymore. It's really about what gives you meaning and allows us to be able to do the right thing for you so that we're not hitting the golf ball in the wrong direction, but rather hitting it in the right direction and ensuring that we're providing good care. And then the last thing I ask, usually recommend is asking for a concrete recommendation. Physicians are there because they have a body of knowledge. So you don't want to go in there and have the doctor say, well, you can do A, which has a 30% of the chance of this and a 50% chance of that. Or you could do B, which has a 40% chance of this and a 60% chance of that. You can say, doc, you know me. I just told you who I am. I just told you I wanted to eat chocolate ice cream, watch football. I enjoy spending time with my family. What would you recommend? How would you recommend that I proceed? And how, what's the best way that I'm going to maintain these parts of my life that's most important? So ask for a recommendation. And don't let the doctor just you know, shimmy away without actually giving you a firm thought about what they think would be appropriate next. You can always defer. You can always say, no, I disagree. I want to do something else. But at least it make, allows you to walk away saying, OK, I have an idea of what might help promote my best quality of life. And this becomes even more important when you're really looking at trade-offs closer to the end of life, because time is really important. And every intervention that we take takes away your time. So that is always a trade-off. And if that time could be used doing something that gives you value and meaning, we need to take that into account. So I'm going to go a little bit dry now, which is to talk about a few different forms. Um, has anyone heard of a pulsed? Oh, great. That's wonderful. OK. So um, I'm actually going to skip one slide and come back to this one. So um, we'll start with the advanced directive. So anyone heard of an advanced directive? OK. How many of you have an advanced directive? OK. Not bad. That's pretty good. Um, I have an advanced directive, too, which I'm glad I do. I surprise myself that I have one, to be honest. But, Everyone should have an advanced directive. And um, the way that I think about an advanced directive is that it's a legal document to talk about your wishes about your quality of life. So the chocolate ice cream football story, you document that here in this document. So you have that con conversation and you write it down here. This is where everyone who needs to know knows what you care about. And then you, you redocument and you redocument and you redocument. It's a living document and it's a legal document. What does that mean? So if you have an advanced directive that says, God forbid, I do not want to be put on a machine, and I do not want cardiac resuscitation. I do not want a machine to pump on my heart or electric shocks. That is only valid in a legal format. But if the paramedics came to your house and you were found down, they could not honor that legal document because they are medical professionals. So they would still have to do CPR. They would still have to put a breathing tube in until you actually came back 
to the hospital where someone would come with an, uh, adv the advanced directive and say, no, 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 stop. This is not what my loved one wanted. Can you please remove the tube and stop life-sustaining measures? So this is an important thing to remember because it documents the conversation. It documents who you want to make decisions on your behalf, which is the other important piece. We usually recommend one person that you say, if I'm not able to speak for myself, this person is the legal decision maker who can speak for me. But then, if you really do feel strongly about life-sustaining measures, such as cardiac resuscitation or intubation, then you need this pink form. So it's really important. The two go hand in hand. So you need the POLST in the state of California if you've decided that you do not want cardiac resuscitation or intubation. This documents that, and the paramedics have to follow it. So we recommend carrying it in your wallet, putting it on your fridge, doing, keeping it very visible, telling all your family members you have one, so that they know that if they were to call 911, which they can still do, to say, please help my loved one, they're, they're having a hard time with pain, or they're having a hard time with breathing, we need you here now, but just don't do the tube thing. Do everything else. So it just gives them some parameters to say, please come, please help us, but we're not gonna do that other piece of things um, because my loved one doesn't want it. So the two go hand in hand if you decide to make that decision. If you decide that you want what we call everything done, which is the status quo in Western society, then you don't fill this out. So you don't need to have this if you want to have cardiac resuscitation and intubation, all of that other stuff. In fact, it's confusing if you do it. A lot, I've actually noticed that there are people here in the community that are now filling it out and saying, I want everything done. So then the paramedics are, you say, I have a pulse. Paramedics look for it. It's wasting time at that point because you actually, this is a distractor. So either have it or you don't. Um, and it should be only if you uh, have clear ideas about that. So I'm gonna talk about something a little bit more um, uh, new and a little bit controversial. Has anyone talk, heard about the End of Life Options Act? Okay, okay. So um, the End of Life Options Act um, is now uh, available to people who live in five states, in the United States of America. Um, started in Oregon. Um, it's also known as the Death with Dignity Act. Uh, it's an act that basically allows patients who have a serious illness with a prognosis of less than six months, who have capacity to make decisions for themselves, and who have the strength to take a lethal dose of the medication on their own, to get access to this medication from a licensed physician, um, and use it if they choose to, to end their life. Uh, this is a, an area um, that was really uh, pushed forward by patients and patient families and advocates. It wasn't really a medical law. Um, and it's something that we're all kind of stumbling through the loops in terms of knowing how to administer the law and how to take care of patients and families who want to take advantage of this. Um, I just want to be very clear that this is uh, not uh, palliative sedation, which happens under the auspices of hospice, mainly because the difference between the two. Has anyone encountered hospice in their care? Okay, okay. And has anyone encountered um, the term palliative sedation? Because I, I don't want to throw around terms that people may not have heard of. Okay, so I'm just going to explain these two because they're important. And the reason they're so important is it's sort of like understanding the post and the advanced directive is if you can understand those two pieces, it starts to all make sense. Like, oh, okay, this is why I need this and this is why I need this. So hospice, for years has been here to provide care for patients who are seriously ill. The thought is, is that if someone says, along like the chocolate ice cream football thing, if they say, I feel very strongly that I do not want to be in pain, and I am willing to take on sedation in order to be out of pain, then it is the hospice's highest priority to control the pain at all costs, even if it means the person's life is shortened for the sake of trying to get that pain under control. We call that palliative sedation, and the intent of that is to relieve suffering. So we actually say that there's a very specific indication for that. 
Um, and that is something that physicians feel comfortable doing. In this case, this is the intent is to take life. So instead of relieving suffering, it, and it could be relieving suffering from the point of view of the patient and family member, but from the point of view of the medical provider who's providing the medicine, the intent is to end life early. So the difference is intent, but the outcome is often the same, which is people pass away. So it's important for um, patients and families to be educated about that because if they're like, I need to do this, I need to have control, it's the only way I can ensure that I can be comfortable at the end of life, that's not true. You can also have a hospice nurse and a hospice physician have an open discussion with them and say, this is my priority, this is what I want, what I don't want, and I want you to honor those wishes. So that can be done with a hospice medical provider at home versus the palliative, um, the Death with Dignity Act, which is you take the medication at home. Um, with, you can have a family member present, but it's usually um, uh, unsupervised, and it has to be um, with the ability to take it on your own, which is not so easy. Often diseases like uh, ALS, um, dementia, other neurological conditions, it's actually quite difficult and challenging to take the medicine on their own. Um, how many of you have heard of palliative care? I'm going to lighten things up a bit. Yay, that's a lot of people. I'm so glad. So um, I think when palliative care uh, was first introduced um, many decades ago, it was equated to end-of-life care or hospice care. Um, that's actually no longer true for many reasons, and we actually think of palliative care as um, kind of an umbrella to caring for anyone with serious illness, whether it's life limiting or not. The way I think about it is if you've had something happen to you where you go from wellness to illness or you start to feel like, I was healthy the other day and now I'm dealing with these, this constellation of things that causes me suffering, whether it be psychosocial suffering or physical suffering or existential suffering, then palliative care teams are there to help support patients and families through that, that shift. And that could be someone who's going through a stem cell transplant and is gonna live for 20 years, or someone who has um, a heart failure, who has a stepwise change in how they're managing their illness, or someone who has an, um, a stage four diagnosis. So it's really for anyone um, who has a serious illness that has symptoms. And um, that's the patient population that we care for at the cancer center, is a, a wide variety of patients and families who have symptoms or distress of, um, that we could help manage. Um, and the reason that we're very, um, we think palliative care is really important uh, and we really uh, would um, appreciate being integrated earlier and often is all the studies, and there have been now six to 10 studies, show that palliative care improves quality of life, people feel better, um, they have decreased symptoms of anxiety, depression, pain, um, that also transcends to family members feeling like they're more empowered, can take better care of their, uh, of their loved ones. Um, and then we also found that people live longer. So those patients who were given palliative care early had survival benefits that were great, better than many of the novel therapeutics that have been approved recently that cost a lot more than palliative care does. So integrating a good holistic approach to caring for the whole person with palliative care actually makes a huge difference in um, longevity and in quality of life. So how many of you have heard of hospice? Okay, also uh, I'm very informed. So the difference between hospice and palliative care is hospice is one like arm of palliative care. Um, hospice, the focus is on pain and symptom management. You do have to have a terminal diagnosis of six months or less and you have to not be seeking curative treatment for the diagnosis that you're getting admitted to hospice for. So this is also an important and relevant point. So I have people who have um, a cancer diagnosis and they get admitted to hospice, they're like, oh, does that mean that I can't go to see my endocrinologist or I can't get care for my renal transplant or I can't, and I'm, absolutely not. You can go see all of those six other doctors, take care of all of those other diagnoses. It's just that you've decided for your cancer diagnosis you're not gonna get chemotherapy, or you're not gonna get a targeted therapy. So you're saying I'm not gonna do um, disease-modifying therapy for that one diagnosis, and then you would enroll in hospice based on that diagnosis. 
Um, palliative care, as I mentioned, um, you do not have to have a terminal diagnosis. It's for people who are seeking curative treatment as well. It's not linked to reimbursement, so it doesn't change your insurance provider at all. Um, but yet the focus is also still on pain and symptom management. Um, the way that I kind of uh, I think about it is because I practice thoracic oncology some of the time, and I practice palliative medicine some of the time, and I think about wearing different goggles. They're either my rose-colored co goggles or my blue-colored goggles. And the reason that they're two different goggles is for two different reasons. When I walk in as an oncologist, I'm looking and I'm thinking, is their white count okay for treatment? Are they neutropenic? What's the third clinical trial that I can put them on? And I've got this list to run through that's just very, very thorough, and I have to get through this. When I'm on my palliative care lens, I often say, this is your time. Like, what's on your agenda? I'm here to direct this visit based on what's most important in your moment. And I might have a few things, but it's more targeted to the patient and family's agenda. Um, and I've also noticed, I don't know how you guys um, feel about this, but the way you react in a dentist office is different than the way you react when you go to see your massage therapist. Now, what does that say? I'm not saying that the oncologist is the dentist and the palliative care doctor is the massage therapist, but context informs the information that you provide to the doctor or the nurse in front of you. So if the context is such that you're like, I need to be really healthy and be really strong so that doctor can give me that next line of chemotherapy, you may not talk about the fact that you're not sleeping or that your pain is poorly controlled or that you have a symptom that's not, because you're really focused on the therapy versus if you're in the context of, a, of the symptom management doctor, you might be much more open saying, you know, actually I'm not feeling so well, my mood's not so great, I'm struggling with my relationship with my wife, my kids, I haven't told them that I'm sick yet and they live far away and I don't really know if I want to tell them on the phone. And so the context informs the type of information you share with the provider that you're with. And it means that both work really well together. So often I work really well with my palliative care colleagues because I learn things about my patients and families that I would have never known if I was just in my oncologist's shoes. So I think of it as a dyad and as a team approach. Um, and often when people go from palliative care to hospice care, I still take care of them. Again, it's a dyad. I'm working with the medical director of the hospice agency to learn about what's their life like at home. I've never actually seen their house. I don't know what their loved ones do. I don't know if they have support. I don't know where their pill bottles are. Um, so I work with them as well to learn how I can better care for patients and families. Um, so this is just a kind of a diagram of how you can get the best care possible. You combine palliative care and curative care for as long as possible. When you have a prognosis of six months or less, you integrate hospice care, and then after someone passes away, you um, have bereavement care. And then there's also this conception sometimes that people want to go to hospice. So, okay, I'm ready for hospice, doc. Where do I go? There is no place to go. So in the sense that we don't have a great structure like in Europe or other parts of the world where we have beautiful hospice units or hospice homes. Home is home, actually. And we hospice is a philosophy of care that's delivered in your home with your family members. And so we train family members to help take care of patients and families. We bring nurses and social workers and case managers and physicians to the house, but hospice is not a location, it's a philosophy of care, and it can be done in a home, in a skilled nursing facility, in a hospital, but it often is done in people's homes. Um, and so something important to know, especially if people don't want to die at home, because it makes things a little bit complicated and you have to think that through in advance. Um, and so now I'm going to talk a little bit about something that can be hard. And I um, am totally happy if you guys say, please be quiet, or I'm going to step out. Um, but I think you know um, the dying process is unpredictable. And I put the serenity prayer here because I hold to this in many ways when I think about how to counsel patients and families who are dying. Because it's a little bit like a birth plan is how I describe it. A lot of women come in and they say, I have these 18 things on the birth plan. 
I want to give birth in a bathtub, and I want these six people there, and I want to make sure it happens with a doula, and I don't want to have any medications. And you have this very firm idea or um, thought of what a, what a birth should look like. And dying is equally, you, you have a lot of ideas of what dying should look like. Many people do. They want legacy, meaning. They have a thought of what this, of what they want their family members to experience. Often it's more about them than it is about themselves. They want to know that their family members are part of it, the process in the way that they want to be. Um, but it can be messy, and it's not always exactly as we plan, and it doesn't always happen in the location that you want. It doesn't always happen with the people that you want. It doesn't always happen with the things, the symptoms that you want or you don't want. And so this is where that acceptance and serenity really kind of holds you in good stead, because you can say, okay, I want the football and the chocolate ice cream, and I want X, Y, and Z, and I'm giving you some direction. But I also know that there are some things that are out of your, outside of your control. And I hope that together, that it's a process that is okay for both of us. And, and go forward. Um, so with that in mind, um, People always come, and one of the conversations that I have, and often they say to their loved one, can you leave the room? Or, Doc, I don't know if you're comfortable ask, like answering this, but I hope you are. Um, but they want the details, just like everything else. They're like, what will I experience? What will this look like for me? Because only if they know can they figure out, is this scary or is this not scary? If it's scary, how is it going to affect my kids? How's it going to affect my husband, my partner? How's it going to affect me? And so you ha people do want disclosure again. And not everyone. I'm speaking to those who do. And often if the loved one doesn't want disclosure, if the patient doesn't want disclosure, um, the loved one does. So I often also ask, what is the intent behind why you want to know? And sometimes I ask, do you really want to know? Because sometimes people are like, no, I'm actually really scared, and I don't really want to know, but I feel like I should know. And I'm like, that's OK. Just let me know, like, think about this. This is an onion. It'll unpeel over time. And, when you, and I'm happy to give you information as you need it, slowly. And, and know that I also don't know. I only know so much. And I can only tell you what's in my clinical experience. I can't tell you what's going to happen to you. Um, so these are some common symptoms at the end of life. Um, pain is one of the things that people are most terrified of. Do not want to die in pain. And I'm thankful that 80% of the time, 80 to 90% of the time, you can control pain. There are many other things you cannot control, but 80 to 90% you can control pain. Um, the other thing that people often comment on is um, secretions, which p family members always notice. They're like, what is that sound? Like, does that mean that my loved one is drowning? What is going on? Like, this is really bothering me. And it's this, um, I'm just going to say the word, it's called, people call it the death rattle. It's this sound that happens at the back of someone's throat because they are too weak to clear their secretions. We don't think it bothers people very much, but it bothers loved ones a lot. So hospice people do a lot to try to control that. And then people get confused. I think one of the things that's very difficult is who we are is between our heads. And so when that starts to change is when we start to feel a loss. That person that you love, that person who's your father, your brother, your sister, is no longer saying the things that you would expect them to say or acting in the way that you would expect them to act. And that is incredibly saddening and alarming for many people. And so counseling them that that's normal, that people do get delirious at the end of life, and that's OK. Um, and we have medicines to help control that. Um, and then these are other things that happen when people's bodies shut down. So skin changes, feels cold and clammy, um, don't urinate, and being in bed is normal. And then the final question, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time on this, is people ask the question, am I starving my loved one? And that's a very common worry. Am I not feeding someone who, I, who should be fed till the end of life? And we generally say when someone can no longer eat on their own, we would not recommend that you try to feed them orally, because it usually means that the food is going to go to their lungs, and they're going to aspirate and have worse shortness of breath. So it should be based on how, um, how they can eat on their own. Um, 
so uh, this is just a, a beautiful picture of uh, two people who have um, stage four cancer, one lung, one pancreatic. Um, life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass, it's about learning to dance in the rain. And I think that um, this idea that you probably have um, in many ways more wisdom than I do, but um, that our lives are constantly full of struggles, changes, things that we have to accept. Um, and how do we continue to dance even when um, it's pouring out and you kind of wish the sun would come out and wonder if it will. Um, but remembering that there's, um, that as a, as a community, um, yourselves, your, uh, your loved ones, your family members, your healthcare providers, you can dance even in the face of serious illness, even in the face of things that are very difficult and challenging. So just a thank you, um, mainly to my patients and their families, um, to my colleagues who make this work doable, um, and to my family uh, for always being there. So, yeah.